welcome everybody. Um, we'll get started now. It is 105. We've got, I'm sure that we'll have more people um, walking in right or walking in soon, rolling in, zooming in, whatever the whatever phrase du jour is these days. Uh, JT has just shared the activity sheet in the um, in the chat box there. So I uh, encourage you to take a look at it. Um, we have a structure at the top and maybe I'll just, um, no, I won't share that yet because what we're gonna, we're gonna talk about today is the idea of backwards design for remote learning. Um, as anyone who teaches you or teaches online regularly will say, oh, good job, everyone. Um, online teaching is different from remote teaching, right? We all recognize that what we just got done doing this spring was kind of a major U-turn in direction, and we had not planned for it, obviously. And so our courses, you know, if we're lucky, um, like Kate was, we were overly um, structured, and it was a pretty easy to transition um, from face to face, or at least uh, not easy yet, doable to transition to fa from face to face to the remote teaching. Um, and backwards design, I suspect might have had something to do with that. The idea of sticking with what your basic learning objectives were, or learning outcomes, learning goals for you and for the students. And then let the, letting that lead and saying, okay, now that we're not face to face, how do I need to shift? I don't have to reinvent everything because I've got those sort of, that's the mission of the course. Um, so congratulations, you've succeeded going through it. We now have summer coming on our way and some of us are starting to plan already for fall. So let's figure out what is the role now of backwards design in remote learning? Can you do a quick raise of your hand um, with the button in the bottom middle of your screen if you know, if you're already familiar with backwards design? And we're hearing the beeps coming in. All right, that's many people, but still a few more people that um, are not as familiar. So let me just go through the basics of it very quickly. As you can see on the activity sheet that JT shared the link to um, in, the, in the screen, in the chat window, backwards design starts off, generally it's, it's shown as having three steps and Generally, if you look at the graphics of it that you find online, if you do a quick Google search, you'll say, step one, what are my learning outcomes? Step two, what evidence do I need to have those learning outcomes met? So I, I see the evidence and I know that I will, I know that they've been met because we have this evidence, right, of it. And then after you do those two, then you start saying, what are the activities that I need to create? Yeah, Lynn, JT will post that sheet in just a second there, I imagine. So it's oftentimes what we did and the way that I learned how to teach was I have a book and it's got 16 chapters and I've got 16 weeks. So week one, chapter one, week two, chapter two, week three, chapter three, etc. And I kind of trust that somebody who wrote the book had a great organizational scheme that helps me, uh, that that sets everything up so that the students can scaffold the learning. I didn't know what scaffolding was when I started to teach. And so that they can um, build off of what they learn from week to week and chapter to chapter. Oftentimes in higher education, um, we're not always using a book. So we have to come up with that organizational scheme ourselves. But it's a little bit broader that we're more, it's more than that because whatever the author says or whatever even the, the course goals are, we have our own agenda that we want to bring, right? We have our own ideas that um, although the course is about X and the learning outcomes are X, Y, and you know, one, two, three, four, five, 
we also think that it's really important that they learn number six. So oftentimes we'll start off with this very sort of teacher centric, I want them to learn these things or they have to learn these things in order to be prepared for the next class. And that's where we get our goals from oftentimes. If you look through, I've got a link for understanding by design in uh, and it's a PDF there. Um, there's a quote there that I'm gonna highlight on the activity sheet right now that, that um, Wiggins and McTee write. In addition to those external standards, we also need to consider, we, we also consider the needs of our students. For example, student interests, development levels, and previous achievements influence our design. And if you think about that, that is perhaps the most important. I, I always call that step zero. Who are your students? You have to know who your students are. You have to know what, what are their motivations? Um, where are they coming from? What stresses do they have right now? How will what they learn in your class help them with other classes or help them with the experience that they have at home? Or how will it, how will it mesh with the motivation for taking your class at all? Sometimes the motivation is I have to take your class and I don't want to be in your class. That's a tr tricky situation, right? Because then, then it's our job to sort of come up with learning outcomes that they can jump into or can connect to and say, all right, I'm not really interested in the class or I wasn't, but this, this, this reaches me. Uh, I, want to, I want to make the world a better place too. So I'm going to grab onto that learning goal, however you phrase that learning goal, um, so that they can start finding connections even if they don't want to, or they didn't think that there were any connections, they just had to take the course because they have to take the course. So they're gonna suffer through it. Once you start getting them motivated, your life becomes so much easier because as you all probably know and have examples in your brain that pop out to mind right away, students who want to learn are easy students and they do good work. They make your life better because they're easy and they're fun because they reinforce you know that's the those are the sparks that we see right when they're when they get things the elements that we love they also make life easier for the other students because that spark or that motivation is contagious um, and if you set it up so that they share why they're excited about it other students will say huh i hadn't thought of it that way but you're right, I'm interested in that too. And it, and it can be con contagious in much the same way that having a student who is negative about your class can be contagious and just ruin the whole course as well. Um, so cultivate those positives by keeping their needs in mind. All right, that's all I'm gonna say as way of introduction. Um, Let's break up, it, uh, no, let's not break up into groups yet. Let's have a whiteboard and I'm gonna share a whiteboard. This is my first time doing this, so. Oh, and I, we were gonna share a PowerPoint slide with that. And I didn't do that. So let me go back and just share a blank whiteboard. And on the blank whiteboard that we're sharing here, I would like you to do write in one or uh, one to five words, how about, or maybe seven, um, but just one sentence. What is it about backwards design that you would like to talk about today? Or what is it that you would like to get out of today's session? And you can use the T, thank you, the T on the top of the screen there, you'll see a little T for text and you can write on that. Um, you can change the color of the text there. With by, if you click on the T, you'll see colors and you can change your colors. We will try to organize those so people will inadvertently write over each other. Um, and that's okay. We'll do that. So the big question is, and I'll write it down. What do you want to learn? And that's a broad sort of statement. All right, and I'm seeing accessibility for language instruction and especially speaking, right? Speaking practice via remotes. Um, oh, thank you, somebody, whoever's doing the organization. I suspect it's Karen because she's really good at that. 
Steps to the process of the process of effective backwards design. Let's see, I'm going to make my window bigger so I can read these things. What does alignment with course learning objectives mean? That's a good question. How to execute grade assessments, adapting backwards design for a summer course with a very condensed delivery time. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's really about honing down what are the important things. Captioning and inclusive instruction. How is it different between remote and in-person? That's a good question. Who did remote versus face-to-face -face design? Oh, no, I get that. It's remote, not remove, but I understand it now. Best activities. Oh, how to communicate to others. <laughs> how to not accidentally. That's, 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 me, that's, huh? that's good. <laughs> this is where it's because I started writing a sentence that was way too long, but in short, it was how to take what I already know about backward design in a face to face class and move it to a synchronous remote version of that same course. Okay. All right, right. And where did our whiteboard go? Any moderators know how to get that back? I think it disappeared, but I took a screenshot of it right before, so. Oh, fantastic. All right. So we're going to take that screenshot and we're going to put it on the bottom of the activity sheet. And the activity sheet again is, I'm posting it right now in the chat. So if you want to go to that, you don't have to look at me for this. Um, I will be over there looking at that and not at myself. At the very bottom, I can actually share that back out. Yeah, Shoko, he does. I'm going to share a Chrome tab, and that's going to be that sheet. And so now you should see in the Blackboard Collaborate window, there it is. So these are our prompts. And with these prompts, we're going to break up into smaller groups because it's easier to have conversations in small groups. When you're in the small groups, um, you will still be able to see this. and. But, and I think you'll be able to see at least one other person at the bottom. Feel free to chat with each other. You can use the chat window with each other. You can turn on your mic, turn on your video, and we're going to have a moderator in every group. So we'll have as many groups as there are moderators, um, minus myself. I'll stay in the, the main window and invite other people to come in and talk about it. Um, and as you're talking, Share your ideas on, you know, building up, build on some of these prompts and talk about what's, what's more important or what's less important. How do you do this in remote learning versus face-to-face? -face? And if you have any questions, later on we're going to come back and I'm going to say, <laughs> please tell us what you did because um, we'll use that and we'll dig on it a little bit further. So, Karen Skiba. I see you're making yep, on. I put people into five groups of six or five. Does that work for you? That works great. All right. I'm going to hit start, and then later on, how much time will everyone have? Let's give everybody 10 minutes. Last time we did seven minutes, and we found out that that wasn't enough. We got feedback that that wasn't enough. So um, okay, 10 I'll, minutes I'll this time. We'll see you all at 1.30. 1.30, and I'll alert people when we're coming back then. So I'm going to hit great. start. Have a good conversation, everyone. <clears throat> All right, and us moderators, we need to put ourselves into to groups. I didn't want to do that so John wouldn't be stuck in. So if you guys could, uh, moderators, take a group. Just drag yourself in. And thank you. Pick a group that doesn't have somebody. I'll take uh, group one.
Margaret Murphy, are you still around? I am here, but I I can't get into a group. Let me see if I can drag you into group two, okay? Can you drag it? I'll All try. right. You're in. I was like dragging it, but it won't move. I had to update. All right. Now, I think I'm in the main room all by myself. Is that correct? Is anybody in here with me? Awesome. That means it's working. Lindsay, welcome. I see you joined and you are, get to be in the main room here with me and whoever else comes in. Um, how are you doing today? Ah, trying to get, I, I see you're in the main chat window. Very good. I will let you know when I can hear you. I can't yet. I'm okay too, yeah. Lindsay, what's your last name? So I'm trying to know if I know if you're a Lindsay that I know or if you're a Lindsay that I don't know. Hey, I do know you. Welcome back. I hope you've been well. I don't have your picture. If I had your picture, I would have I would have seen that. There you go. Now you're much more recognizable. <laughs> What would you like to learn about backwards design or what questions do you have? What can we um, talk about that would be useful for you? I've got the other folks are all in groups right now. So you get to tell me.
All right, you can think. Can you hear me? Yes, there you are. Oh my God, I'm tired of typing. Okay. Um, how is Welcome. it different? How's it? Thank you. Um, how's it different uh, for regular uh, in-person learning? That's All right. My, that's the main question I have. Very good. Did you get yeah. the link to the activity sheet? I have it right yeah, there. Yeah, I saw. I mean, I have so many windows open. I went into Cliff's um, <laughs> Google room by accident because I didn't know what to click on. <laughs> Uh, I was on the canvas page and I was just all these little links and stuff. I just started clicking <laughs> where I was. <laughs> okay. Very good. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. Well, yeah. so the circumstances are different, right? The uh, the remote teaching is is. I think the big thing is. Well, I would say that one of the biggest things is, um, we need to, in my opinion, um take into account the different situations that people are in and you know they don't have the um, the accessibility items that they, they they might otherwise you know usually have um, uh, some of them might be uh, in worse situations stressed out about different things mm -hmm. um, and if we don't take that into account, and you know, we've seen examples of courses where people are like, yeah, I'm just gonna assume that everybody can get in and assume that everybody has fast internet because I do, and assume that everybody has, you know, two or three screens because I do, and we're going to just why aren't they participating as much? And we don't right, recognize right. that they're in different circumstances right now. And they mm -hmm. might be in, you know, the uh, in a car in a parking lot in a library in rural Wisconsin where they, you know, because right. their their home internet isn't fast enough. Right, right, true. So how can we build those things into our our course? And mm. it's, it's, it's hard to do like in mid-semester in spring when it was just kind of like, okay, next week you're shifting. But for summer courses, we can start to be a little bit more intentional about it and say, mm -hmm. all right, there are going to be some people that are facing X, Y, or Z. Mm -hmm. What can I do with that? Are you teaching this semester or this spring um, or no. fall, the winter, summer? Uh, no. Um, no, no. Hey, did you get your internship? What's happening with that? Uh, no, because they changed the policy for studying abroad, kind yeah. of everything got <clears throat> turned upside down. So uh, I'm sorry to hear that. That's okay. So, I mean, I feel safer maybe not traveling. Well, not that I can anyway, but, right. you know, getting that. Right. But, um, but still. I think, it, I think uh, some, some of the learning would probably turn into more asynchronous just because if people don't have Wi-Fi, they'll have to just, because, like, language classes rely on synchronous, but they might have to turn more into asynchronous just because, I mean, for the most part, like maybe 80-20, and the 20 is just used for, like, talking with a partner when a time works for you or when your Wi-Fi is working or especially if you had to go back home to um, another part of the world you might not be awake you know and so I think yep you think needs to you need to do backwards design for asynchronous because it's you know people aren't feeling well and they're on the other side of the world and the Wi-Fi is spotty so anyway yep. oh. all right I think 
we're all coming back. So welcome back. Was 10 minutes enough this time? Was it too much? We'll, uh, we'll adjust accordingly. But it definitely the, uh, wasn't too much. It wasn't too much. Okay, good. But I think those could go on and on. So. Right. <laughs> it's, it's kind of an endless hole once you start digging into and finding out what different people are, where they're coming from mm -hmm. and what's happening with them. Um, so what are the big insights that, that we got out of that? What were any, any, anything stick out in any of your groups? And Erwin, I see, oh yeah, raise your hand. I should, I should say that. Everybody knows where that raise your hand button is in the middle. If you raise your hand, um, I will call on you. JT, you have your hand raised, so you get to go first. Thanks, John. Uh, one of the things we were right at the very end that we were talking about that I, I hope this is something we can uh, pursue in the larger group was um, the importance of backwards design and also um, student buy-in and engaging students in that process of explaining how the, the bigger um, perspective and value of the course um, in relationship to the objectives themselves. Um, I don't know if anyone from our, from our group wants to um, take that a little bit further or anyone, but that was uh, a conversation that we could have spent another hour on. So. Anyone else want to jump into that regarding buy-in? Yeah, Rit, go ahead. Thanks, JT and John. Um, yeah, we were talking um, in, in our group, Marcus in particular, and I began on this riff about synchronous versus asynchronous. And, right. Um, and so that, whether you're, the activity you're doing with your students is um, happening synchronously. That is, their learning is happening synchronously to what you're doing with them. Or whether those things are happening asynchronously is, um, it's almost like two things at once. And so <clears throat> I gave the example of the recording feature that I see is on right now in Blackboard. And I was using that a lot in a, both an undergrad class that had 28 people in it and a graduate course that had um, 13 people in it. And the graduate course was different from the undergraduate course. The professional French master's program, people all had their cameras on, for example, all the time. The undergrads tend not to want to be on camera, which created right. another barrier. Um, and I do think not having yourself on screen makes this half as like an encounter than it could be otherwise. That's just my bias. Um, Wait, half as much of an, uh, so you're, half, you're pro being on half. screen. Uh, synchronous encounters like the ones we're having right now to me seem yep. much more like an actual meeting when I can see the person moving in time in addition yeah. to hearing when they're speaking. So like those things have a pretty huge effect on the environment um, during the course, especially with students who might be a little more hesitant to engage that day or overall. And so um, one trick, so we're in the synchronous space right now. One trick I found that it always works is the use, you just did it, the use of the breakout groups and um, the breakout groups have a kind of musical rhythm to them in the overall you know course period because before something starts to get kind of droney or it's like a talking head to me on a screen i'm watching netflix my brain goes into that watching something happen mode and then there's an announcement that we're about to go into a group and i'm going to give you 10 minutes and then we're going to tell you a minute before it's over like there are three little quick things that delineate what's going to happen and then there's a task that i want you to do and here's what it is very clearly during that period of time. And you can do all that in like 30 seconds, which you guys just did. And that is like a shot in the arm to the students individually. It seems like to me in my own assessment with my students and, and it, it gives them a new boost and they come back from it. They, they do struggle sometimes in the groups if you go visit the little breakout groups, but yeah. And they're not that it, it gives them like it fills up their gas tank and then they come back. And that's the same. That's the same as in a regular face to face discussion. If you break them into groups, right? Some of them struggle. Some exactly. of them talk about what did they do last night or whatever. But that's a natural part of being a human and connecting with other humans, getting to know them, building up trust so that you can have these deeper conversations with them. Like that's all a big part of it. So, yeah, great. Thank you. I'm glad that worked. Uh, thanks to uh, Karen, Karen, and uh, JT, and others uh, for pushing that forward. So good. Other things that people talked about. Oh, right. So JT, my, it's on the screen on the, in the chat window. The the tech element is, is there, right? We heard this from students a lot. We, I just got done reading a um, student input from a survey that the um, Do It AT did of students this over spring, what happened? What do they like? What do they not like? What do they struggle with? 
um, in this remote, the shift to remote teaching. And Rit, what you had mentioned, that's absolutely true for them as well. They're isolated, they felt disconnected. They really wanted, they wanted that Brady Bunch screen where they could see everybody in there, right? But in order to have, you know, eight videos running on your computer, you need to have pretty good internet. Um, even with, you know, a few tabs open, and I say a few, it's a few, it's like 20. Um, my Blabberate will start saying, hey, it looks like you got video problems, and I'll have to undo this, undo it all. Yeah, uh, JT writes in the comment, and I'm sure that you're all seeing this, so I, I won't read it. I'll just direct you to the comment part of your box. Um, does anyone else feel like um, this helps to engage the students or, or give them a shot of energy? What are some other things that you've done to sort of break up the monotony of your course? And more to today's point of backwards design, how can you make that part of your learning objective that it all starts from? If you make it part of your learning objective, you say students will connect to each other or students will find value in discussing this topic with each other, then everything else can, your evidence and activities can lead to that. Erwin, go ahead. Hey. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. Uh, Erwin here from LSS. And uh, my question is more like, I would like to poll you guys about a course that I will be teaching at the end of the summer. It's a writing intensive course, a 300 level course. And one of the things that we used to do when we're teaching it face to face is having peer correction. And I'm, and I'm leaning towards something that I'm calling a uh, synchronous star in which it, it's, I have like around 55 students right now. And what I'm thinking is I'm going to pair them up. And uh, my, my, well, my concern is that finding a time for all 55 to work together is next to impossible. So what I will do is pair them up and give them the, the freedom to that pair get together on their time and then find a time for all of them to report back. Uh, some people suggested, well, ask them to record their, their meeting and that way you can have some sort of like a finger in the pie, but I don't wanna watch 30 videos of them peer correcting each other nor do, do I want to give them the impression that, that I will even remotely see them. So I, what do you get, how do you guys feel about that? So I think you're absolutely right with that. One of the things that we need to look out for in our learning objectives, maybe not explicitly in the learning objectives, but we need to take care of ourselves too, right? There's only so much that we can do as humans. Um, one of the big things that came out of the student survey was um, they felt like many of them felt like they got a course and a half, that the instructors were trying to compensate for not being in the face-to-face -face physical classrooms. And in doing so, they added on a whole other coursework, you know, level amount of work. So you have the course and a half syndrome. You need to protect yourself as an instructor from that course and a half syndrome as well and give yourself some time to not look at 30 different videos um, and take care of your own mental health as well. Shoko, go ahead. Hi, everyone. This is Shoko. Um, I think what really worked for me was not to use the word learn and know in the learning objectives. <laughs> and I think that alone just really helped me a lot. Um, and what it is that they're doing in class and then what's the overall competencies that they're eventually gonna get after lots of practice. And so I think kind of distinguishing in class competency versus kind of outside of class overall competencies and then just avoid the use of learn and know. So what do you use instead? How to like identify, recognize, discuss, practice. Um, a lot of those words that are, that's available in Bloom Taxonomy, I think. Sure. I think that really oh, helped. Yeah. There's a, a great, um, if you just Google Bloom's Taxonomy plus verbs, you'll find all kinds of alternative um, options um, so that we don't just keep going to the students will learn, students will understand, students will 
there's a, there's a lot more than yeah. that. Yeah, and also I, I want to second what Rit said about use of breakout room and uh, use of whiteboard. And my slide deck is really not going to be lots of densely texted slides. I think lecture slides, maybe I'll have five of them, and then I'll have a, a slide deck that says, here's what's going to happen in the next 10 minutes in a breakout room, and then kind of instructions on what to expect and what to do inside of breakout rooms. And so I think that really engaged learners. And my learners are employees. So um, maybe it is a little different from um, students who are taking mandatory um, required courses. So I'm not really sure how to engage students in those courses. Yeah, I don't think it is. I don't think it's different. I think that, you know, people are people and we all can use some guidance rather than being thrown into a room and be like, well, let's figure it out. There's value in being thrown into a room and having to figure out what you're what you need to do. But it's hard. And for a group of strangers that haven't been prepared for that, um, you know, if they don't know each other, they don't trust each other yet, um, they haven't had those sort of um, scaffoldings to um, build that stuff, that makes it hard. And and one more thing, John, um, yeah. that naming convention that you shared when you're not logging in, I asked people to write their first name and then use the word at symbol and then where they're located because the oh. audience that took, came to my class were in Superior and Green Bay, Janesville, they're all everywhere. So it was kind of nice to see where they're at. And That's brilliant. Kind of, that was a way to bring people together. So I'm yeah. complete. That's a great strategy. And I like think about other ways that you could do that, um, even if they're not, even if they're just all in Wisconsin or, or it doesn't matter the physical location, you could have in parentheses, um, how are you feeling today? Or in parentheses, what, you know, what is whatever. But do first and last name, Karen Spader and Erwin, because otherwise I'm going to confuse you with other Karens with an I and Erwins that I know. JT, go ahead. Just following up on what Shoko was saying, there's a really good um, chat conversation going on. I was, um, I was, I was just thinking sort of, Shoko, I mean, the, the idea of learn and know are portions of a larger skill, right? So it's not that those are, are bad in themselves, but they just, they're sort of lower level, but not necessarily not as, not as worthwhile. Um, and I see your point, but at the same time, you do need to learn and know something sort of to be able to move on to the next step, even in your own creative pursuit, for example. So there, there are two big um, points that I'm that I'm seeing here. One is connect with the students, and that means get to know who they are. Try to facilitate um, the connections between the students so that they start to know who each other is. Um, and Shoko talked about how to do that by saying, "Where are you from?" or "Where are you coming from?" Because it's that extra information that just gives us a little bit more, you know, context about who we are. Uh, one of my favorite things for learning people's names is I can look at their name and their face, and that's that's good. But I won't remember their name unless I say, "Tell me your dream." I can remember people's dreams with their names much better than their face or where they're from or whatever because it's important to them. And when they tell me that, their face lightens up and then, you know, it just become it, it activates a little bit more. So what else can we find out about them? The more that we ask them, the more that we can figure out what are their personal learning goals? Why are they here? What are their motivations? So that's build that into your, into your, um, your learning outcomes, not just for yourself, but for the students to get motivated. And then the second one, the second thing that we wanted to, that we, theme that I heard was structure, 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 structure. Tell them what they're want, to, what they're going to learn. Tell them, um, help them make those connections between their own goals and what you want them to do. Give them the rubrics that they can connect onto. So the rubrics provide structure, but you've got to make that structure open enough, I guess, for them to be able to jump in wherever they can. 
Or at least, do you have an idea? <laughs> nope. Okay, let's right go. <laughs> All right. I, I was just ahead. going to say um, the structure, yes, very critical. The rubric, I, I thought about the rubric in a different context, though. I was thinking more about yeah. the rubrics more in the context of assignments and helping them better understand the requirements of the assignment. And so we're to the point now where if you don't have a rubric, students become pretty frustrated because they feel like you're not giving them enough detail as to the expectations and how you'll be grading them. Yeah. Uh -huh. So I, I think the idea of rubrics outside of grading are also really can be useful because rubric can provide guidance on here are the things that in a, in a discussion that's not being graded here are the things to think about you know are you doing this this or this at what level you know are you um, connecting with each other you're not going to grade them on connecting with each other but do you know their name do you did you ask them a question about um, each other questions about where you're coming from I think rubrics can be, uh, and I used to be so against rubrics um, because I saw them as limiting. Like, I'll do the excellent categories, and people will do that and nothing more. But now I just do excellent as beyond, you know, I do that excellent category as four instead of five, and then five is sort of less defined so that they can bring whatever they want to into that to make it even better than what excellence is. JT has added a value rubrics, um, AAC and new uh, value rubrics in the chat. That's a great resource for hitting some of these uh, stickier, harder to define, harder to assess um, ideas. And again, they don't have to be for assessment. Um, they don't have to be for uh, a grade or any sort of summative thing. It can be just formative. It can be, am I, as a student, am I asking the right questions? Am I behaving in the way that uh, the rest of the class expects or that my instructor expects? Anytime you can give them a little bit more guidance on that, that's great. That is Good. very helpful, John. Thank you for providing a bit more um, detail on that. I, I'm excited to think about how to incorporate that. All right. And now, Lindsay, now you can talk. Go ahead. Um, for probing their interest in personal learning goals, one of my online art classes, um, they had us make a poster of ourselves yep. or, or, or stuff about ourselves. So we use different things that represent ourselves. Um, mm. So, that's Lindy, can you speak up just a little bit more? Can you hear me now? We have some folks now? in the chat who cannot. Can you hear me? Oh, it's better now. There you go. Thank you. For one of my online art classes, we made a poster uh, with uh, different visual representations of ourselves. Not necessarily our own picture. Some people did, but you choose things that represent your interests and your goals. And it was like a nice way to um, open the class with visuals and say, "This is who I am." And people, um, bonjour, <laughs> ça va. Um, and um, so that was a, a nice way to learn about other people in the class without having to, you know, talk about ourselves for five minutes. Or, you know, we remembered, "Oh, that's that's Jeff, and he likes baseball, and um, he's a bio it's major." A Oh, yeah. yeah. Associations, they help. They add, add uh, texture and richness to who we are. So we're not just that gray avatar that we become a little bit more. And this connects with the idea down in the media in the activity sheet here under give remote earn learners the agency that they get in video games. I had not planned on talking about video games and learning when we were talking about backwards design. But in some ways, the fact that all of our learning or much of our learning now is happening in sc on screen instead of in face-to-face -face environments, a lot more of it sorts of starts to apply because a lot of video games happen on, on online. So taking the idea that you did it with your art class, Lindsay, can you help learners create their learning spaces? Can you give them an opportunity to co-design or to customize um, to um, have some identities or put on different hats that they might um, want to view a, pers a perspective that they might want to view a problem with. Um, can you give them opportunities to manipulate some of the learning instead of just listening? You know, how can you contribute? How can they contribute? 
give them a Google slide and say, hey, here's a slide deck. Everybody grab a slide and make a slide. That's how you could do an, uh, an online poster doing what you did with that face-to-face -face poster. Um, so lots of good ideas. And there's a lot of opportunities because the whole of all of the internet is at their disposal now. And if it's an asynchronous course, they have all the time you know, between classes as well. So there's a lot more that you can do online um, and in this remote teaching space than you could do in a face-to-face -face space. Rit, go ahead. Thank you. Something the pandemic and and the and the and the quarantine that comes along with it has brought into focus for me is this um, idea of what you're doing pedagogically in your remote course is is competing, and you have to think about you know um, that it's competing with other experiences. And if you read you know Slater, uh, Chronicle of Higher Education kind of stuff, uh, right now you're going to read about these doomsday scenarios where colleges are going to close everywhere and there's going to be four big huge colleges left that give all this online instruction and everyone's going to flock to them so it'd be it'd be tempting to think that i got to keep branding the uw or wherever i work with my style of teaching online but i think that actually the competition that i see that that animates good teaching is that because everyone else is looking at so many other screens all the time and this, this connects with the idea of the, the metaphor of the, the video game or whatever or the analogy um if we think about what distinguishes this with this experience, this this task at hand that's part of my um, lesson plan today, and that's true of every task today, has to distinguish itself from the other many myriad things that are happening online in this person's day today, especially right now. The Netflix they're watching later tonight, the sort of video conferencing they're having with their loved ones, whatever. So like, <clears throat> that's helpful in a way to think about like, they're on screens all the time. So what is it about this task that is unique to the learning that I'm hoping is happening right now and here in a way that's unique to this space? And that's that's just a guiding principle that kind of came to the fore for me because I thought, God, everyone here is all on screens all the time right now. Right. And, and that can be tiring. Good. Good points. Erwin, go ahead. It ju just took it back to to pull in the, the group here. Do you guys think it's, it is a good idea to to pair them up and let them decide on what time works for them so they can do their peer review on their own time and, and, and just delegate that responsibility to them? Yes, absolutely. And I see people are voting in the, in the chat box and that's, that's excellent. And Sorry. here's another reason that this is a good idea, Erwin, to do that. Um, if you try to do it on your own, you're that third member and you're also not protecting yourself. Um, and then they have to go through you and it, it becomes, I don't know, it, in, in some ways it shows that you don't trust them to do it themselves. And a big part of building a trustworthy or trusting cohort of students is to give them that agency, give them that power to take charge of their learning. Be clear that you have expectations and that they need to do it, but how they do it, that's up to them. And whether they do it on Zoom, which is not a UW-supported tool, but it's okay if they use it on their own, or if they do it on, um, you know, on their phone in TikTok or chat, Snapchat or whatever, that's up to them to decide. Let them have that power. Ooh, and I saw a great distinction here. That means that Karen said something. Right, does it, does it even have to be synchronous? Um, if you want that, the richness of audio and video, that can happen with these things just as easily as a synchronous one. I can go through, I can read the paper on my own time, um, think about things and do an audio recording as I'm going through paragraph one, paragraph two, paragraph three, hit send and that file goes to them. They can listen to it on their own time asynchronously um, and they would still have my voice. They would still have the um, my pauses and uh, all of the richness that comes with nonverbals. All right. Oh, such good stuff happening in the chat here. And I'm not able to keep up with all of them. But look at the chat. Julie's got some great ideas here as well. All right. 
other thoughts? We have four more minutes. What do we want to end with? I think one of the things with um, with video games, as long as we brought it up, and I did, um, it's hard to create a video game. It's hard for you as an instructor to create a video game or to create something as, um, it's hard for you to plan an activity that is as rich as a video game because you're just one instructor and you cannot think about how they all work with each other. But some of the most compelling video games out there right now are people interacting with other people. So what can you do in your class to have the students challenge each other, to have the students, I'm going to use the word compete, I don't like the idea, but compete and collaborate, play, to play with each other around the topics that you give them. In this case, all you have to do is give them a topic, give them a couple of ideas of, of how they can do that, leave it open for them. Again, the idea of empowering the learners. Hey, students, here are three ways that I want you to do X, Y, or Z. If you have a fourth way, go ahead and do it. Just reach the goals and then tell me how you did it because that might be a better one than the ones that I gave you. So let the students challenge each other. They can do so much better in a small group than you can trying to direct it all, um, depending on whether you have 12 students or, or 1,200 students. All right, two minutes left, and I'm trying to think of any other things that uh, folks can say. Oh, there's the Wisconsin experience. I do want to point out that on these um, documents that I've put together, they all link to, yeah, let me change that out. means I have to stop sharing a screen before I start a new one. In the Wisconsin, um, in the activity sheet, I've got uh, find more information about these things. And each of those links to, I think I'm sharing it right now, a whole page that I put about um, how to do these things. So how to align it with the camp. You've got those good problems to explore how it aligns with the Wisconsin experience, some examples of ways to do it in Canvas. These are left over from when we were transitioning to Canvas, but a lot of it still applies even more now, more now than ever in some ways because you don't have that face-to-face -face thing. And in some ways, I've got uh, links down here. You're already doing this stuff. So take a look at that. Each one of those documents has uh, different ideas but please add your own ideas to those as well. And with that, it is 1.59. I'm happy to stick around for the next few minutes and uh, continue to answer any questions.